to episode 44 of the Comic Boot. I'm Kalen. I'm Cody. And I'm James. You seem vexed. No, I was just turning off the music. Oh, it was it still going? Just a little bit? Yeah, but I hit like a wrong button, and then I was seeing if it like still showed up across the wavelengths or whatever. On we the really don't have our shit together this week. Dude, it's, it's, it's been a very unique week. Well, you've had finals. I've had finals. Well, sort of. 20-page paper for one class, a five-pager for another one. It's been kind of hectic. But <clears throat> needless to say, um, Kalen and I, um, last week, watched something that really kind of hit home for us and made us realize that the podcast that we're recording, the Comic Boot podcast, um, might not have ended up being what we wanted it to be. Um, this whole thing, the comic boot, the idea of the comic boot got started out of, of course, a personal love by all three of us for comics themselves. Um, but more than that, the name, the comic boot, came from um, us getting evicted out of a Facebook social networking group for standing up for diversity for none other than Amadeus Cho. And uh, Jessica Drew, Drew, uh, or yeah, Um, basically we stood up for diversity and um, the idea that women shouldn't be objectified in comics. And, And racism. And racism. And since then we've been kind of blinded. I wouldn't say blinded, we've just kind of fallen into... The pop culture uh, trap. idea, trap Anyway. idea of what comics are now, because there is an extreme saturation of comic book material everywhere you look. Not only do you have the books that you can read, the trade paperbacks that you can read, but it's it's all over television. It's all over the movie theaters. You know, it's we talked about it on games. Tuesday. Video games. We talked about it on Tuesday that we're getting like six or seven comic book movies this year. Which is ridiculous, especially whenever you think back to 1989, whenever Batman was the only comic book movie released in 89. You know, in 27 short years, we've gone from... One to... Well, one, I mean, if you can't want to count the Superman movies, you know, we have three or four to, you know, having seven this year. But it's intellectual property that is a perfect translation to a big screen. And it makes an ass load of money. It does. The problem is that when they do that, what these characters and what these books were originally written for get lost. And we watched uh, Superheroes Decoded on the History Channel, part one and part two, and we realized that maybe we are going down a wrong path. We don't have the most listeners in the world. You know, those that are here, we love you guys, but we're going to change some shit up. And I just got done talking to Cody about it, and I think we're all in agreement that it's time to kind of make a turn and turn that corner now that we're in the 40s on, you know, covering story arcs or movies or animated movies or television shows, which we're still going to do, but we want to talk about social ideas surrounding these movies, these television shows. We want to concentrate on that stuff. Like, for example, whenever we talked about Luke Cage, you know, we talked about Luke Cage, but we may have glossed the idea of Luke Cage and what he stood for, why he was created, the purpose that Luke Cage serves, and how it translated onto the television screen, which I think it did somewhat. Pretty well. Pretty well. Because of the, the hoodie. The, they, they uh, in this new era, they basically traded chains for hoodies. Yeah. But also, with what Luke Cage was doing on television, it was about the, the Black Lives Matter movement. Or movement and that got like really... That. That hit really home, or hit home really hard later in the season. It did. It was a little bit in the beginning, but then it just reached a certain point where it was just, 
the fo- the focal point for a couple episodes towards the end. But Kayla and I have had a couple of uh, intense, kind of amazing conversations about social movements in the United States currently, um, and things that we want to see from comics. And I think that us reading the Flintstones has kind of opened, I think it, it pried open our eyes, and us watching Superheroes Decoded um, kind of pushed us down a stairwell. Kind of like grabbed both of our eyelids and like ripped them open. Watch this shit now! <laughs> We're sitting there like freaking Clockwork Orange with the eyeballs, you know. Yeah, the Vico Tech. Yeah. yeah. Um, but I think one of the main problems is that something that really forces us to look at our social status or social issues in the world today should not be the Flintstones. I am completely surprised that it's the Flintstones because, but it's also not mainstream. People don't go to a comic book store or like, I need that Flintstones right now. They don't. Because they say, I want Spider-Man, I want Superman, I want the Avengers, I want Iron Man, I want Batman. And the writers of those, those books were started for reasons, though. And they I were. Think that they both were. Or all of them All were. of those were, uh, that you just mentioned. But I think that what's been lost is is why. Why, why do we want to read these things? What do these things stand for? You know, we talked about that talking about the first Iron Man movie. That it was anti-war. It was, you know, Tony Stark realizing that he shouldn't be dealing arms because they end up in terrorist hands. Yeah, he shouldn't be a war And then Disney here. going, whoa, that might be too much of a message. And kind of toning that back for Iron Man 2 and then subsequently Iron Man 3, where they just became light shows at that point in time. I mean, they lost their... Uh, they lost the message. They lost the moral dilemmas... They just lose more and more depth in the pursuit of money, I think. Captain America, which, excluding Civil War, honestly, I think the second one, Winter Soldier, may be the darkest movie in the Marvel catalog. Yeah. Honestly. It it is. I mean, it's not just... What it is. not Not just it being dark, but it taught us a valuable lesson of beware your governments. Yes. You know what I mean? Because they thought they could trust S.H.I.E.L.D., and then it turns out Hydra was growing within S.H.I.E.L.D. this entire time. And that's a message that not a lot of people want to talk about and not a lot of people want to take away from that movie. They want to take away the awesome fight scenes and Bucky versus Cap and those things, but they don't want to talk about the shit Scarlett that Scarlett Johansson's boobs. Yeah. They don't, want, they don't want to talk about the things that, that matter, that really matter. Of course it matters that we escape and that we have these heroes that we can... We can turn on a television and forget about our problems. But if we forget about our problems, who the fuck is going to fix our problems? Right, and that's what superheroes have always been. And of course some people say, but Kayla and James, these topics are quite political. Well, no shit. Yeah, we're going to get fucking political. And but and you're not. A lot of people aren't going to like what I have to say about political stuff. And I don't think you're not going to really like does. what I have to say about political stuff. I don't think but... anyone likes what when you talk. <laughs> <laughs> you're an asshole. I will keep. I will say no comment. But. I mean, you can't talk about comic books without talking about politics because ever since pretty much the creation of comic books, they've gotten very political. Superman was created in 1938. By two Jewish men. By two Jewish men. After one, well, come to find out, and this is going back to that documentary, come to find out that one man's uh, father was killed. I think it was um, Schuster. Schuster's dad. Schuster's dad was shot by a robber while they were trying to steal suits. From his dad's um, suit, or because his, his dad was working the shop, and then men came in, yeah. wanted to steal stuff. His dad got shot and killed. And so Schuster goes to bed one night after his father has been murdered by these robbers, and uh, has a vision of Superman. Runs to his buddy Siegel's house. Isn't it? Uh, what the hell is it? Mitchell, maybe. I think it's his first. I don't know. Michael. Remember. Michael Schuster. No, Siegel's first name. Joe. Not, not not Benny. Anyway, Siegel, he runs to Siegel's house and says, I have this amazing idea. And Joel. Joel Siegel, yeah. And um, that's when Superman's born. Um, and if you notice a lot of those early, early Superman comics, um, one of the lasting images that you see is him knocking a gun or breaking a gun. Very anti-gun. Uh, in, you know, nineteen late 1930s, early 1940s America where it's run by mobsters. 
you know, and then of course we see that's why Batman is created to fight these mobsters, whereas Superman is more of the godlike character. He's more of the godlike. He's more. He's the big blue boy scout. He's yeah. the he's the peace and he's the hope. And but he's he was the always the shining dead. example. But and then you have he was also a socialist. He was a socialist, absolutely. And then he got transformed from a socialist to selling fucking war bonds because that was the 40s and 50s world war ii and you have to be patriotic and one thing that isn't well, really captain america's creation too exactly yeah, time. but one, Wonder Woman. one thing that's yep. very american is capitalism and then when you throw in mccarthyism <laughs> You know, socialism is bad, communism is bad, we yeah. want capitalism, free market, blah, blah, blah. Because when he's created, I mean, we're only, you know, a decade and a half away from, black, you know, the blacklist in Hollywood and things like that. Going yeah. On. So, you know, any kind of artist would be targeted. But and, then, course, and then there's the Happy Homemaker, uh, that big, huge facade surrounding the Stepford 1950s. Wives. The Stepford Wives, the men in the gray flannel suits, and what you think is like the picture perfect 1950s and that's when superman was seen like what with the the bald eagle on his arm and yeah. the, and the and american that's, flag that's everywhere first your truth justice in the, the american, american way. way motherfucker you're from krypton right you're not even like you're not, you're not fucking even human well, you may live in america but... to, wasn't it new 52 he renounces his u.s citizenship oh that i don't know i mean that's... that happened superman did that in one of the I think it was New 52 run, he did it. Was it in Superman or Action Comics? I don't remember which one. Was. Action Comics, was Action Comics going on the turn of New 52? Yeah. Yeah. I thought it had ceased for there for a little bit. Mm -hmm. No? Nope, kept going. Um, but, yeah, he renounced his U.S. citizenship. Hmm. Which is That's huge. Interesting. That is but huge. But it's the idea there that, like, not that at the time that it was, well, I mean, it was still an issue at the time, but I think it's more of a main issue now, the whole deportation issue and everything but it's the idea that like if your greatest american hero is not even from earth yeah and he still feels like he should fight for these people but you disagree with him yep you know you know and that goes you know getting on the political side of things you know it, it, the uh, the concept of america and i'm not going to go into the history lesson of what america is but you know there's an issue that why is one person that's born, you know, 20 minutes south of El Paso, a lesser person than someone that's born in El Paso? Because of a line on a map? I mean, that's the stupidest shit I've ever heard in my life. You know, when we created borders, we created walls around villages to protect ourselves from other tribes. It's fucking 2017. You know, the last thing we need is a wall to protect our tribe of millions and millions and millions of people across 3,000 miles from the Atlantic to the Pacific. It doesn't make any fucking sense. The idea of borders... Morally or financially. Right. The idea of borders is absolutely asinine. But the problem is is that we can't, we can't erase the lines because they've already been drawn. You know, to erase a line at this point in time, it takes a war. And no one's going to go to war with the United States, like Mexico or Canada... But I think hopefully eventually we get to that Star Trekian future where we don't have to worry about borders anymore. Or money. But every country has to be on board in the world. That's Absolutely. not going to happen. Yeah. You know, and then if we try to, as a country, impose that on other people, you know, then all of a sudden we're the tyrannical, you know, warmongers, which we kind of fucking are. A little bit, yeah. You know, I mean, who do you think made ISIS? Yeah, well, Us. the United States made ISIS. Of course we did. That's a fact. You know that no one can, no one can. It's those question radical that. Islams. It's all their you fault. Know, it's no, it's the United States' fault. You know, because we wanted to play proxy war with Russia during the Cold War in Afghanistan. And you would know it's your major. Well, it's that's a fact. The U.S. Too. government funded the Taliban. Yeah. Yeah. We're, we're the reason they have all the guns they have. I mean, that's... I uh, that, but that's honestly what it is. It is. What was that in in Lord of War when uh, Nick Cage finally gets captured by Ethan Hawke and Nick Cage is in this interrogation room and Ethan Hawke...